Good day and welcome to our confidential report for April 2022. Since the last confidential report, of course, uh, Central Europe and particularly Ukraine, Russia have taken center stage and um, they've pushed aside the sort of lingering remains of COVID-19 and they've even managed to temporarily displace the rise in world inflation and the fact that central banks are beginning to push up interest rates. In our view, what we are watching is the final death throes of the USSR. The USSR, of course, was reduced to just Russia after the Afghanistan retreat and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Many parts of the USSR became democratic and capitalist, and they then joined NATO. Putin has always wanted Russia to return to the old USSR boundaries. And that, of course, his policy there began with the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and Ukraine was the next logical step. But Ukraine has been capitalist and democratic for 31 years, and that posed a big problem. They didn't want to return to the Russian um, to the Russian uh, autocracy. What is clear now, though, is that Putin has made three bad mistakes in his invasion. First of all, he signaled his intention to invade three weeks in advance, and this gave both the Ukrainians and the NATO powers a chance to respond and to prepare. The second mistake that he made was to use that old-fashioned blitzkrieg tactic that was used in the Second World War by Hitler. And that just simply doesn't work. Tanks are no match for javelins. Aircraft have a big problem with stinger missiles. So he's really ground to a halt in many places because of the modern technology. The third mistake he made was that he underestimated the massive response from both the Ukrainians and also from NATO. He has, in fact, he has, in fact, unified NATO in a way that nothing else previous to this has been able to do. And NATO now speaks with one voice, and the Ukrainians have turned into an incredible, uh, powerful military, which is using very intelligent tactics, obviously supplied by NATO, and Putin now faces a virtually impossible situation. The Russian economy is crumbling. It has runaway inflation and it is facing world sanctions and it is losing ground in the war, retreating. The Ukrainian army is gaining confidence and competence. Putin has made himself into a world pariah. At the same time, he has made Zelensky into a world hero. We believe that Putin will not survive. We believe that leadership in Russia will change as a result of this. It may take a few months, it may take a few years, but I think the end is inevitable. And following that, once there's a new regime in place, we believe that Russia will eventually move towards a capitalist democratic society and maybe ultimately join NATO. The process will of course take time and there will be bumps along the road. But the impact of Ukraine and the events in Ukraine on world markets is fading. The oil price has been falling back. The attention of the financial markets is turning elsewhere. Some JSC shares, of course, have been impacted because they have business in Russia or because they are involved in commodities. But this has been an opportunity to buy high-quality blue-chip shares at a discount. There has been one lasting effect as far as South Africa is concerned. Our refusal to vote against Russia has made, ma makes no sense to us and I think it's going to have consequences. Russia is just 0.4% of our exports and 0.2% of our imports. Our largest training, trading partners, of course, are America and Europe, and then China. 
and SA's attitude has been noted, and I believe it will impact our dealings with other countries in going forward in the future, especially America. I think when they look back on this, they will say that South Africa did not support them, and so why are they supporting South Africa? That is what I think is going to happen. All right, let's turn our attention now to America. Um, just going to put um, the S&P 500 on the screen for you so that you can see roughly where we are. That's the position where we are at the moment. Of course, the Monetary Policy Committee in America has raised interest rates by 25 basis points on the 16th of March, and that introduces a new cycle of increasing rates. They are aiming to control inflation and to normalize the U.S. economy and reduce the uh, Federal Reserve Bank's balance sheet. Consumer price index in America has reached 7.9% in February. That's the highest level in 40 years. And more inflation is obviously going to come because of the jump in oil prices above $100 a barrel. Petrol in the U.S., rose by 40% in January and 38% in February. The, the, the Fed's preferred rate of, of inflation rose just 0.6% in February, but that still is 6.4% per annum. Both these measures of inflation, both the PCE and the CPI, are, are measured before the Ukrainian invasion. So we can expect that inflation rate to go up, in my view. The, Fred, the Fed's pro projection for the PCE is 0.41 of a percent per month. That is what they're projecting. They're saying that by the end of 2022, the PCE will be 0.41 of a percent per month. And that means that the PCE must increase by an average of 0.35 percent per month from here to the end of the year. And every month that it's above 0.35%, like last month when it went up by 0.6%, increases the likelihood of a 50 basis point hike in interest rates. And in fact, recent comments made by the Fed indicate that a 50 basis point hike is quite likely at the next Monetary Policy Committee meeting. Raising interest rates will have a negative impact on shares, a temporary negative impact. We don't believe that that negative impact will last for long. Um, and the main reason for that is that the economy will keep producing strong statistics. For example, during March month, the U.S. economy created 431,000 new jobs. So that's not an economy in recession or anywhere near recession. That's an economy growing strongly. The unemployment rate fell to just 3.6% which is very close to full employment. The so-called quit ratio is rising as more and more people look for better wages in a job market which has got a, a distinct shortage of employees. The average hourly wage rate is up by 5.6%, which is still below inflation, but rising fast. One of the things that uh, economists look at quite closely is the yield gap or the yield curve, which is the gap between the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury bill and the, and the two-year U.S. Treasury bill. Usually the 10-year is above the two-year and because obviously you're tying up money for longer, so you want higher interest rates for that period. And when they invert, when the, when the two-year yield is higher than the tenure, they call that an interest rate or a yield inversion. And that is a sign of impending recession. We did see an inversion very briefly in March, mainly because of the spike up in oil prices as the Ukrainian crisis started. If that was sustained, it might mean that the US economy was going into recession in 18 months to two years from now. As you can see on the screen here, looking at the S&P 500, we've had a significant or a major correction. 
which started from this record high here on the 3rd of January and ended with this double bottom over here in March. The lowest point that the S&P 500 reached was on the 8th of March at 4170. And that means that this major correction was relatively modest, falling only 13%. The entire correction has been characterized by very strong bullish sentiment though. That caused us to have two, two dead cat bounces. Here you can see the first one, there's the second one. And then of course we've had also a very short period of sideways movement characterized by this double bottom. And then the market shot off that low base. Very, very strong recovery. So those are the things that show you that there's a very strong bullish sentiment underlying this market. If we look at this cycle high here that occurred last Tuesday, Tuesday last week, um, you can see that that cycle high is just 3.4% below the all-time record high over here. So that indicates that that record high is going to be broken fairly soon in our view. So now, with the Ukrainian crisis fading, the main factor in world markets has reverted to the rising inflation rate, world inflation, and rising interest rates. Central banks are increasing interest rates to control inflation. We have said in articles previously that the S&P would make a new record high by the end of this year. We now think that to be conservative. In fact, we are now expecting a new record high before the middle of this year. World inflation is rising, especially in the US. Central banks are responding. The Ukraine has been a, a major factor in their decisions, but not that big. It hasn't really stopped the rising interest rate cycle. Over the last 50 years of watching rate cycles like this, rising interest rates, what we've noticed is that they tend to cause short-term bear moves. So when the interest rate hike is announced or thought, or thought that it will be announced, the market moves down. But then that gives way to optimism as there are new strong economic numbers, like with the 431,000 new jobs created in March in the US. That's a classic case. The negativity of rates, rising rates is forgotten quickly because the economy is in top gear. So there's also in America another thing that's going on which is also an indication of a strong bullish market and that's a wave of share splits. The best example being that of Tesla. Eventually, of course, rising interest rates will impact on the profits of S&P 500 companies. But history tells us that that point is not imminent. We expect that point to come maybe in the second half of 2024, at the earliest. So this 13-year bull market, which has been going on since uh, March of 2009, we believe has got at least two more years to run. But of course, the situation we are looking at in markets is unique. There's never been a situation quite like this. And so it's very difficult to predict. Our attitude, and we believe your attitude, should be to make hay while the sun shines, but to watch markets very closely for signs of the top. All right, let's turn our attention now to South Africa. Um, the pressure to uh, increase the social relief uh, distress grant and converted into the basic income grant was rejected. The SRD or Social Relief Distress Grant was extended for a year, but kept at the same level of 350 Rand per person per month. Obviously, the basic income grant would have required tax increases, and that would be bad for job creation and growth. Also, the recent decision by the NEC, the ANC's uh, National Executive Council, uh, to back Ramaphosa as president has helped him. 
Ramaphosa now seems to be fairly secure for the ANC December elective conference. Extending the, the uh, social relief distress grant for a year has cost the country 44 billion rand, but it has helped to shore up his position. The ANC's deeper problem, of course, is their loss of voter support. We believe that in 2024, in those elections, the ANC will almost certainly get less than 50%, and it will, of course, then have to rely on other parties, probably the Democratic Party, to pass legislation through Parliament. And that, of course, also will make Ramaphosa vulnerable to a vote of no confidence, and Parliament will no longer be simply there to rubber stamp policies which the ANC wants. Um, but they will have to argue cogently in Parliament. And the composition and the individual members of Parliament will suddenly become significantly more important. Ramaphosa just had his uh, fourth um, investment conference. These investment conferences have become quite a win for him. In 2018, he said, he said that he wanted to bring in about 1,2 trillion rand of foreign domestic investment. At the latest conference, he brought in 333 billion, which brought him to 95% of that $1.2 trillion target. Overseas investors are clearly encouraged by South Africa's fiscal and monetary policy disciplines. The inflow of funds has resulted in a steady strengthening of the RAND, despite the effects of COVID, the civil unrest, and now the crisis in Ukraine. But this achievement, of course, is unlikely to help the ANC in the 2024 elections. Looking at the economy, it's clear that the Reserve Bank has done an excellent job of managing South Africa through the COVID-19 pandemic. It has resisted pressure for undue fiscal stimulation. It hasn't dropped interest rates too low, despite the threat the civil unrest last year. And now, at the end of last year and this year, it got in ahead of the rest of the world by increasing rates and keeping our advantage on our bonds. The repo rate has been raised three times now uh, for a total of three quarters of a percent, and inflation remains firmly under control. And the economy is beginning to grow. There are definite signs of growth coming through in the South African economy. In fact, the Reserve Bank is predicting 2% growth this year, with inflation at of 5.8% and then falling to 4.6% in 2023 and 2024. That is a remarkable achievement. GDP grew by 1.2% in the December quarter, which was far better than expected. And what was interesting was that vehicle sales in February were 18% up on last year. Obviously, some of this is due to low interest rates, but the hike in fuel prices is a problem for vehicle sales. But altogether, the vehicle sales show that the economy is doing well. The Ukraine crisis is likely to impact on food prices in the coming months because obviously Ukraine and Russia together supply about 25% of the world's wheat. So we can expect the price of bread to go up. South Africa imports about 40% of its wheat and poorer families will be forced to eat more maize and less wheat. We can see that coming. The petrol price has been kept under control by dropping the fuel levy for two months. And it looks like the oil price may have peaked and may be coming down now. At the same time, the rand has been strengthening, which is good, obviously, for petrol prices. Despite this, the fuel price is now over 21 rand a litre, and we think will probably stay there. The growth in the economy has not been accompanied by any rise in employment. And partly that is due to the disappointing performance of the construction sector, which is a very big employer. Unemployment in the fourth quarter jumped to a record 35.3%. And if you take into account discouraged workers, it rose to 46.2%. That means that officially, almost half of the South African workforce is unemployed. Obviously, the measures to contain uh, COVID-19 have been a factor, but we want to make two important points about this unemployment rate. The first is that the unemployment rate, in our view, underestimates the impact of the informal sector. 
Our streets are full of people running small businesses. Every traffic light has swarms of salesmen. Entire mini, the entire minibus taxi industry is in, in the informal sector. Thousands of spaza shops are on every corner and in every street. The informal sector, of course, is a euphemism for tax evasion. But South Africa, the South African economy works to a very large extent in cash and does not pay tax. The second point we want to make about this is that the primary cause of unemployment is the draconian labor laws in this country. The labor laws are a political hot potato and cannot easily be changed. The ANC is scared of taking on the unions because of the votes that they command. Laws, the laws favor the employee and work against the employer. Businesses do not want to employ people because they cannot easily fire them. Moody's highlights this and says that the big problem is the constraints emanating from the malfunctioning labor market. That is their words, Moody's works. The malfunctioning labor market. And they say that that is one of our key problems. We believe that until the labor laws are made more business friendly, we will continue to have high unemployment. Turning our attention briefly to Eskom, we see that the uh, National Energy Regulator of South Africa has granted a license to a company called Empower Tra Trading, Empower Trading, to generate, distribute, use the national grid, and charge less than Eskom. This is indeed a first. And with the new Electricity Regulation Act, it allows power to be traded freely within the South African economy. Consumers and suppliers can trade at prices not set by NURSA. This is a massive step forward and, and generates a lot of renewable competition. It also means, it also, it also signals the end of Eskom, in our opinion. Of course, Eskom didn't do itself any favors by bringing in more load shedding in March which went to stage two and then stage four. And of course, it's using very expensive open gas turbines to make up the difference. Okay, let's look at the RAND now. Um, just want to get the RAND on the screen here. Uh, where are you? Down there. Right. So at the last confidential report, we suggested that the RAND was undervalued against hard currencies, especially the US dollar. Since then, there's the last confidential report on your chart. As you can see that since then, the RAND has strengthened substantially. In fact, it's, it's, it's strengthened by about 5.6% against the US dollar over the last month. During the Ukraine crisis, um, it, has, it has sustained itself remarkably well. We have not seen the RAND collapse during the Ukraine crisis. Uh, and that indicates the strength of the currency. You would have expected that during the Ukraine crisis there would have been a shift towards risk off and therefore emerging market currencies would come under pressure. But the RAND has held its own ground remarkably well. And this of course shows that uh, there's overseas confidence in this country. The strength of the RAND has, has countered the effect of rising oil prices, and that's been a benefit to us all. We expect the RAND to break below this previous low over here. Um, you can see, uh, actually, not even that one. I want to put a bit more data. This low over here. This low where the RAND reached 13.43 to the US dollar. So we're expecting this strengthening trend to continue, and this low to be, uh, which, which occurred in June last year to be take to be taken out so we think the rand will go below 1343 to the US dollar on this cycle and that of course will help to cushion the impact of inflation and the strength of the rand is reflecting our stronger local economy and the fiscal and monetary discipline that this country has applied and that is why we've got those strong words from moody's and, and our rating has been improved to positive from, or, or sta stable from, from negative. So that's a good factor in our favor. Let's look at the commodities market briefly. The impact of the Ukraine crisis on commodities has so far, so far been fairly short and sharp. 
The oil price spiked up to $123 a barrel. Um, if we go to that oil price, just to give you a bit better picture there, uh, put a bit more data on the screen here. Here you can see that the oil has been oil has been operating in a channel. Um, there's the impact of COVID-19. And then you can see we've got an upper channel line, a lower channel line. The Ukraine crisis has caused the oil price to spike up above that channel, the upper channel line, but it has now fallen back within that channel. And we believe that it, it will probably uh, come back to find this lower channel line in due course. Europe, of course, is moving very quickly to find alternatives to Russian oil and gas. But we do believe that the commodity boom will continue. Gold and platinum moved up on the Ukraine crisis but have fallen back since. We think that the commodity boom will continue at least until the end of 2024. So South Africa should get quite a bit more money in as a result of higher commodity prices. Sanctions on Russia will, of course, also tend to increase prices. And Russia competes with South Africa as an exporter of raw materials. So this is generally good for South Africa as a competitor of Russia. Okay, moving on from that. Um, one of the questions I've been asking myself over the last month is what is the next big thing that's going to impact markets? Of course, after the 2008 subprime crisis, we had the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. We, and now we've got the Ukraine crisis in 2022. What is the next big thing? We are all aware, of course, of the rising world inflation and therefore rising interest rates. Ultimately, that must bring the great bull market that started in 2009 to an end. But in our view, that will only happen at the end of 2024, at the earliest. So what else could impact on markets in the meantime? We think that the initial effects of climate change and global warming may be on the cusp of becoming a major problem. Already this year, we have, we have had some exceptional climate problems, record hurricanes, storms, floods, droughts. The United Nations has said that the 1.5 degree Celsius tipping point is just 18 years away. To keep below the 1.5 degrees, we would have to cut emissions by 45% by the year 2030. As things are going now, that is not going to happen. Instead, as things are going now, emissions will rise by 14% by 2030. Now, suddenly, in the middle of this, we find out that temperatures in the Antarctic in March this year were 40 degrees above the average temperature for March in the Antarctic. Nobody knows why or what the consequences will be. Last week, a 1,200 square kilometer ice shelf called the Conga ice shelf broke off and fell into the sea. This caught scientists completely by surprise. East Antarctica is supposed to be relatively stable and no one knows what the effect on sea levels and climate will be as a result of this. Clearly all is not well with the weather. The most immediate impact of climate change is likely to be food shortages. Prices of staples will begin to rise sharply there might be food rights and starvation. Perhaps it's time to look at your portfolio and consider its exposure to things which might impact on climate change. All right, let's spend a bit of time now looking at companies. I begin with the new listings that are likely to come to the JSC or that have been proposed. First of all, the Coca-Cola Bottling Company of Africa, CCBA, is going to list on the Euro next in Amsterdam and also on the JSC. Obviously, the JSC will be a secondary listing. That company is 67% owned by Coca-Cola International. And the objective that that company has is to spread throughout Africa. But it already has about 40% of the, of the African soft drink market. South Africa accounts for about 84% of its sales. And its sales per annum run at about 50 billion per annum. When this company lists on the JSC, it will be a high-quality blue-chip institutional share. So don't forget to watch out for that, and um, it may well be worth investing in that company. Telcom has delayed the listing of SwiftNet. 
SwiftNet, um, of course, is their towers and property company, and they've delayed it due to the events in Ukraine. SwiftNet has 1,300 properties with about 6,000 cell phone towers. Telcom, Telcom plans to keep 80% and to sell 20% to the public in order to raise capital. The Reserve Bank also said this month that they plan to list African Bank. Um, they've, they've tried to sell it unsuccessfully. So obviously African Bank is the good part of, Af of uh, ABLE, what was called ABLE, the African Bank Investments Limited, uh, from years ago that went bust. So the Reserve Bank stepped in and they took over the good assets and they called them African Bank and they're planning to list that company sometime relatively soon. All right, let's turn our attention to companies on the JSC. The first one I'd like to look at is Master Drilling. Um, Master Drilling is an interesting company. It specializes in drilling primarily for the mining industry, uh, but it has diversified into other areas. Um, so I'm just, there's a five-year chart. Maybe we can even pull a bit more in here, make it, and you can see what's going on with this share. Um, the company has, has got an innovative new technology which involves horizontal drilling and tunnel boring. And this technology is much quicker and cheaper than the old blast and clear methods. If, if you look at its financial results in the year uh, to the 31st of December, revenue was up 40% and the earnings per share in US cents increased by fivefold. You can see here that the chart was falling and we had put on a trend line and suggested you wait until the trend line was broken. That break came over here in uh, February 2021 and since then the share has been moving up quite strongly. So we believe that this share is cheap at current levels. It broke the trend line at 806 cents in, in, uh, in about March 2021 actually. And it's now moved up to about 1450 cents, 1460, it's around that level. But even at these levels, it's still on a PE um, of about uh, 7, 7.7. So it looks like a bargain to us. The next company we want to look at is Remgro. Now, Remgro is a large international diversified investment holding group. I just want to put uh, more data on the screen so that you can see here. Um, Obviously, this is a rising company. It's a blue chip. And what they're doing at Remgro is they are unbundling. So like all investment holding companies, they tend to trade at a discount to the value of the assets which they own. And in the case of Remgro, that discount is about 35%. And they have got a policy of trying to unwind that discount and to release the value into the hands of shareholders. That policy has resulted in a couple of sales. They've sold their 25.8% of Unilever, and now they've sold their 31.8% uh, share in Distel, but they still own 44.6% of MediClinic, which has divisions in Switzerland and Saudi Arabia and South Africa. So that could be coming up for sale sometime too. They also own 23% of Grindrod and 30% of Seacom. Um, in their results for the six months to the 31st of December this, uh, 2021, the net asset value was up 14.2% and headline earnings per share went up by 139%. So the share is trading at the moment for around uh, 142 Rand, around 142 Rand. And it has a, a, a... Sorry, I must have got that wrong. Let me just check that quickly. Yes, the shares trading or closed uh, on Friday at 149 rand. Sorry, last night at 149 rand, and it has it has a net asset value of 202 rand 47. So it's trading at a significant discount to that net asset value, and you can see that they have a policy of releasing value into the hands of shareholders. At the moment, they're sitting on a price earnings ratio of about 17, and we think that that share represents very good value. All right, let's look at one of our favorites now, Clicks. This is a company we've been advising you to buy on weakness for a long time. I'm just going to put more data on the screen. In fact, a lot more data on the screen, a lot more data on the screen. There we go. That's what I wanted to show you. 
Uh, what you see on, on the screen here is the upward trend in clicks over the past 15 years. So this, this patch here, which goes, from, uh, which goes between these channel lines, is 15 years. And you can see the share has been rising steadily throughout that period, and that it's now bouncing along the bottom channel line, the lower channel line. And that means that it represents relatively good value at these levels. This is a great business. Everybody knows about clicks. They've got 782 stores, 585 pharmacies. Uh, they bought pick and pays 25 in-store pharmacies recently. They're growing their store base at between 25 and 30 stores a year. So it's a diagonal share. It goes from the bottom left-hand corner of your screen to the top right-hand corner of the screen. And we think that the share is cheap at current levels and you should pick them up uh, when you get an opportunity to do so. So that's clicks. The next one we want to look at is uh, Consolidated Motor Holdings. Um, this company runs car dealerships, Toyota, Volvo, Nissan, Opel, Lexus, Mazda, Ford, and so on. Um, quite, a, quite a big company. Um, again, we put five years data on. You can see that the share was trending down but has broken up through that lower trend line now. Uh, in their results for the six months to the 31st of August 2021, revenue was up 55% and headline earnings per share were 200 cents compared to 14 cents in the previous period. They obviously uh, have been trending down. And again, we suggested that you put on a long-term trend line like this, wait for that upside breakout, which occurred on the 1st of February 2021 over here. Uh, at 1490 cents now they're trading for about 2750 so there's been a, a really good jump there they're sitting on a pe of about six and a half and that represents good value the next share i want to look at is eoh um, this is obviously a company that um, used to be a real darling amongst shareholders in south africa uh, you can see it was going up over here, and for years it was it was a number one share of the institutions they were buying. And then it, it had a double top here. You can see that double top in the chart, and then it started to fall. And all sorts of bad news came out about how they were involved in state capture. Eventually the CEO of the company, Asher Bobot, resigned, and the company just seemed to be going from bad to worse. And then, of course, this is the impact here. You can see the steep fall here is the impact of COVID-19. And the share touched bottom over here at about 270 cents. And then shortly after that, um, they appointed um, Stephen von Koller as the CEO. And he's been cleaning up the company, consolidating its dozens of companies into three divisions and repaying debt. Uh, so we, we, we think that this share is a good share. We think it's about to break on the upside now. Um, in, a, in a trading update for the last six months to the 31st of December 2022, sorry, to the 30, 31st of January 2022, they said that their headline earnings per share would be between 38 and 44 cents per share, which compares with a loss of 38 cents last year, in the period last year. So we think this share is going to move up quite strongly at this point. Okay, and then finally, I'd just like to look at Advertech. Um, Advertech, of course, is an education company um, which has both uh, school and tertiary education. Um, okay, I'm just going to put more data on the screen here. Let's go to a 10-year chart. Here you can see the basic picture. Um, Advertech has been falling. Uh, the share price was falling from 2017 all the way through to this upside breakout here. Um, they own things like Crawford College, Trinity, Varsity College, Rosebank College, and so on. They've got 109 schools and 33 campuses with about 84,300 students. In the year, in the year to the 31st of, January, uh, of December 2021, their headline earnings per share were up 33%. This is a company which has got significant blue sky potential because parents are always willing to pay for their ch children's education. Education is one of those things that people pay for in advance. So generally speaking, a company like Advertech does not have a working capital problem. And as you can see, the chart broke up strongly. And with the correction on Wall Street and the Ukraine crisis, 
it has been moving sideways in what is called a flag formation, which you see here on the on the right hand side of the screen. But we think it's about to break up out of that flag formation. Um, and, and we think it, it represents good value at these levels. Well, folks, that's about all I've got for you today. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you got something out of it. And I'll speak to you again at the next Confidential Report, which will be on the first Wednesday in May. Thank you for listening to me.